Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jesse Patterson. I am the Senior Director of Business Development here at CKDM. And on behalf of CKDM, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, The Generation of Innovative Therapeutics Using, using Artificial Intelligence. Uh, this is the second uh, webinar in a series of three um, that we're, um, we're, in, we're, we're launching on the evolving landscape of AI implementation in new drug discovery and development. Um, I guess the rapid expansion, um, you know, in the adoption of AI, you know, in biopharma R&D means that staying on top of, you know, this, the, the current state of the art um, can be challenging, you know, everything's changing, everything's evolving, new things are coming out. So we're happy to be able to kind of leverage our, you know, network, our, our connections within the biopharmaceutical industry to organize this event and, and bring a bit of a, a global perspective of, of kind of the current advances to the Canadian and, and Quebec ecosystems. Uh, first, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Um, first, if you have questions uh, for consideration during today's panel discussion, uh, they can be submitted via the chat function or there's a Q&A function. Uh, however, please note that there's already been several questions kind of pre-submitted during the registration process. So we may not get to uh, questions that are submitted today, uh, but we'll do our best. Um, deuxièmement, pour ceux entre vous qui sont intéressés, une traduction est disponible pendant la webinar d'aujourd'hui. Pour y accéder, vous devez cliquer sur la petite icône de la planète dans les contrôles uh, de la réunion. All right. Um, so for those of you, just I'll, I'll take a couple minutes just to um, kind of introduce you. For those of you who don't know CKDM, we're a Canadian biopharmaceutical research consortium. Uh, we have a unique model uh, that allows multiple players within the, uh, the sector, including academic, uh, early stage biotechs, global pharma, um, and co-funding organizations such as patient foundations or disease foundations to kind of come together and, and fund it and more importantly, de-risk early stage technologies. Uh, so, you know, our mission really is to support and facilitate multi-stakeholder collaborative R&D that accelerates transition of leading end discoveries into vaccines, therapeutics, and, um, and diagnostics. Um, and I want to kind of take a moment to focus on that accelerates translation uh, because I think that 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 really does apply um, you know, to AI and, and that's really what AI is doing um, in, in, in kind of revolutionizing a little bit of, of how AI, uh, or sorry, how biopharma R&D is being done. Um, and it's why that, that AI and its use in biopharma has become a kind of a priority research area for CKDM and why we're proud to be supporting kind of the development of some next generation AI enabled tools for drug discovery and, and development. Um, Canada, um, I think for, for a long time has been, you know, globally recognized for the strength of, of our biopharma uh, research ecosystem and, and the results that we put out. Um, and more recently, you know, on a global perspective, I think we've really gotten international recognition for the, our strengths in the AI field. Um, so when you combine those two strengths, uh, you know, I think we can create a really powerful and have created a really powerful AI biopharma ecosystem in Canada. Um, so at CKDM, we work, we look forward to working with Kind of our public and private partners in the AI uh, ecosystem and biopharma ecosystems and supporting these uh, kind of multi-stakeholders uh, projects um, in this expanding sector. Um, and I also just want to mention, I've mentioned kind of public and private partners a couple of times, um, but when I'm saying multi-stakeholder or, um, you know, I think, or collaborative research, I think I'm also, what I also want to highlight is the importance of multidisciplinary research. Um, and in Canada, interprovincial, so bringing across uh, groups from across Canada together. Um, I think that these are key factors for leveraging the expertise from Canada um, and will be of particular importance for driving innovation in the AI and biopharma sectors. Um, and, and, you know, to do this and to, to leverage our unique collaborative model to bring this forward, um, we've developed this an extensive network of partners from across many sectors of the biopharma research and more recently have been expanding that to include the AI sector. Um, and so we've got a number of partners in there, strategic partners, including uh, Toronto's uh, Vector Institute. Um, therefore, we're extremely grateful that uh, Matthew Johnson, Director of Innovation at Vector Institute, has accepted our, uh, you know, our invitation to open today's webinars with a couple comments. Uh, Vector is an Ontario-based not-for-profit kind of a corporation or, or organization dedicated to the research in the field of AI and with ex excellence in machine and delete deep learning and a particular relevance for this, um, you know, webinar for today's discussion um, really does have a focus on the applications of AI and health as a key strategic pillar. So Matthew, um, floor is yours and, and please go ahead. 
Okay, thanks very much, Jesse, and good morning, everyone. Bonjour. Thanks for joining us this morning for what should be a fabulous discussion on the applications of AI and therapeutic development. Uh, as Jesse said, my name is Matthew Johnson. I'm a director of industry innovation at the Becker Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Toronto. We are one of the premier AI research organizations in the world and one of three specialized AI institutes in Canada. Vector was created in 2017 with foundational support from the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and a visionary group of enterprise sponsors representing a broad spectrum of the Canadian economy. We are up to 31 of these sponsors now, including a few new ones that will be announced over the coming weeks. And so when I joined Vector two years ago, I recognized the opportunity for innovative biopharma companies in Canada, much like the big tech companies, banks, consulting firms, telcos, really to leverage the leading edge research and talent emerging from Vector. And so we went about expanding our partnerships uh, in this sector. And we were thrilled to announce in November of 2020 uh, that Roche, Roche Canada had joined our consortium, uh, coinciding with the establishment of their National AI Center of Excellence in Canada, uh, known currently as AIR, AI with Roche. And we're excited uh, over the next couple of weeks that we will announce uh, a new global biopharma partner uh, ha has joined us. And so I'm really thrilled to be here today. And I wish to thank CQDM and Amgen for this invitation to say a few opening words, uh, but I'm mostly grateful to be here to listen to the panelists uh, describe how they're applying these really relatively nascent techniques, machine learning and deep learning, to age old questions in human health and disease and really building brand new approaches to target, uh, in some cases, intractable biology. And uh, not to play favorites, but I'm especially looking forward to hearing the latest from uh, Abe Heifetz from Atomwise, because Abe and I first met back in 2013 or 2014 when he was a recent PhD graduate from the University of Toronto. And he is and his co-founder, Itzar, were starting this company that proposed to use something called deep neural networks to essentially uncouple drug screening from the physical realm of the wet lab. And so a lot of people, and especially traditional life science investors, looked at him sideways back then, which is probably a big reason why uh, he's moved on to um, the, uh, the left coast of California, where the money tree tends to grow more readily, uh, though I am proud to have worked with him in those early days in Toronto and helped him to secure a small seed investment for Atomwise uh, before they moved on. And Atomwise uh, has really come a long way since then, and we'll hear about that today. But it's also fair to say that the commercial environment for biotechs and AI companies in, in Canada has rapidly matured and capital markets know there is money to be made here, so that secret is out. And over this past, past decade, the field of AI for drug discovery has grown by leaps and bounds ar around the world, but those deep roots in Canada for both biomedical research and AI, the roots from which Adam Wise and Valence Discovery, another presenter today, have sprung, position Canada as one of the leading jurisdictions in the world to bridge advanced AI with biopharma R&D, and ultimately, across the entire biopharma value chain, from discovery through clinical development, manufacturing, commercial operations, and even post-market surveillance. And we're seeing this play out in the growth of startups in this space across Canada, um, in global pharma and biotech, tapping into our machine and deep learning expertise and exceptional talent through partnerships with Vector and our sister institutes, Mila and Amy, as well as their investments in establishing AI labs around these centers of AI and biomedical research excellence. So if you're in this world like me in the next few years, uh, I'm sure we'll be having uh, a lot of fun and we'll see a lot of innovation emerge uh, from this ecosystem. And so that fun continues today with today's panel. So let's get started. Uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to pass the baton now to Philip Tagari, Vice President of Research, Therapeutic Discovery at Amgen, who will introduce the panel. Philip. Bonjour à tous. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, it's a great uh, privilege 
to uh, speak to you today um, as part of the second in a series of uh, uh, webinars that address the, um, as it were, grand concerns of drug discovery. The first webinar, which is still available as a recording on the CQDM website, um, and I strongly recommend that anyone uh, who is listening today who didn't uh, uh, attend the first webinar um, go and go and listen to the recording. The first webinar dealt with um, really, you know, what to work on uh, in terms of drug discovery. So, which biology, which indications. Uh, and particularly which drug targets. And that is, you know, foundational to our industry. Today's webinar, um, by contrast, really focuses on, you know, the hard work we do um, in the industry to turn those insights into bio from biology and medicine into potential therapeutic candidates, medicines that could make a difference to thousands or millions of people uh, who have a few or no alternatives. Um, and, and we don't underestimate um, how difficult that is. It's an enormous uh, endeavor. Um, I have over 500 people in my own organization uh, working in the laboratories, um, essentially around the clock to find new uh, and innovative therapeutic candidates. And so there's been an enormous amount of interest on the application of machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence to make this process um, faster. Patients are waiting for our medicines um, to allow us to deliver better therapeutic candidates uh, and to foster innovation in the industry. And so today's um, webinar is really focused on the generation um, of therapeutic entities. Um, there is a, a bias somewhat towards chemistry um, in presentations and that, um, you know, as, as, uh, uh, as we just heard, um, is really based upon the maturity of the use of high-end computational techniques uh, in discovering new uh, chemical entities. But I'm very pleased to say that we have um, a presentation from Marina Madrid, uh, co-founder of Chilino Bio. Um, which will show you how uh, AI can be transformative as we think about cell therapy. So um, buckle up and I hope you uh, enjoy the presentations uh, and we're looking forward to a really good discussion afterwards. And so now I'd like to introduce um, Daniel Cohen from uh, Valence um, for the first uh, set of presentations. Daniel. Awesome. Thank you so much, Philip. And um, thank you to, to CQDM for, for hosting and for the opportunity to share some of our work. Um, I believe we should have slides that are on their way up. Yep. Perfect. Um, so we'll, we'll just spend a few minutes today talking about some of the, the advances in generative chemistry that we're particularly excited about at Advalence. Um, I'm Daniel Cohen, co-founder and CEO at Advalence Discovery. Um, and as I said before, really, really looking forward to the discussion today and uh, very happy uh, to be here sharing some of our work. So if we just move ahead to the next slide. Yep, just jump ahead to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so really, really are, for anyone who doesn't know us uh, at Valence, we are a seed stage company originally out of the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms really focused on using advances in, in machine learning and computational chemistry to design novel therapeutics against what have historically been considered as, as challenging or intractable targets. Uh, and everything that we do computationally, and in particular, some of the concepts that I'll introduce quickly today are in service of that ultimate mission. And if we jump ahead to the next slide, what Philip had asked us to touch on today is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about at Valence. And it's something that we feel is especially relevant in the field of drug discovery compared to other domains like natural language processing or computer vision, which is how much data do we actually need to enable AI-based molecular design? If we jump to the next slide, 
Well, one of the reasons that this is so important is that, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, uh, is that deep learning typically goes in hand in hand with, with large amounts of data. But for reasons related to timing constraints, infrastructure constraints, resource constraints, uh, biological constraints, we, we simply don't often always have access to these very large data sets in a drug discovery setting, uh, especially as we advance in a program and begin to focus on, on properties beyond just potency, or if we're working on more novel areas of biology with limited or no historical precedent. So you can take, for example, the, the chart that's shown on this slide from a real-world drug discovery program in early lead optimization. And you see that for many of these, these parameters, we have less than 50 data points available. And for approximately half, we have very few or no existing compounds to satisfy the activity criteria of interest. If we move to the next slide, we, we can ask, well, what about large pharma? Uh, what about public consortia? Surely all of that historical data makes this a non-issue. One of the, the biggest challenges that's, I think, unique to drug discovery is the nature of chemical space itself and, and how it's organized. And the fact that we often end up in very new subsets of either chemical space or biological space that are distinct enough from what we've pursued in the past, but existing data sets have limited utility. And one of the problems that we're most interested in at Valence is this question of how you can generalize from known or existing chemical and biological space to new space, even, even for example, in the absence of any known ligands or for an entirely novel target. And if we move to the next slide, uh, one of, one of the, the ways in which we can approach this problem is through the development of, of entirely novel machine learning approaches that are better suited to the very unique constraints of, of drug discovery. So from, from, from how we featureize these small molecules and ligand target complexes to how we can learn computational representations of, of SAR in very low date environments to how we screen, design, optimize, and synthesize novel compounds all the way through to how we can use computational tools to enable uh, better collaboration between medicinal chemists and computer scientists, which I, I believe is something that Ola will touch on later this morning. But if we just jump ahead to the next slide, um, I think we just want to spend a minute or two here touching on three themes that we're very excited about at Valence that, that we believe really challenge this notion that you need very large amounts of data to enable effective molecular design. So we'll touch very quickly on how you can generalize, efficiently generalize existing SAR, how you can make uh, predictions on key properties, and how you can drive optimization against multiple parameters all in what are fundamentally low data environments. So if we jump to the next slide, the first concept I wanna to touch on uh, very briefly is, is a concept in machine learning called out of distribution generalization. Um, so this is something that we think a lot about from a computational perspective, but has very significant implications in, in drug discovery. Specifically, how can we leverage existing data, whether from our own programs, whether from patent literature, to help us move into differentiated biological or, or chemical space? And also, how can we improve the properties of our, our compounds beyond what's contained in the training data? For example, how can we go from micromolar to nanomolar? And what's shown on the slide is an example of this. It's a program that had hit a dead end due to ADME liabilities in their primary series. And what we were able to do was use these technologies for out of distribution generalization to design entirely novel chemotypes that were more amenable to subsequent optimization while also in maintaining or improving specific parameters that we are interested in in this program. And you can imagine that these types of technologies can become extremely helpful or, or useful in either reviving a struggling program or bootstrapping a new program or simply helping to create backup series for a program that's advancing well, even if existing data is quite limited across our parameters of interest. If we move to the next slide, another concept that we think about a lot in machine learning is known as active learning. Um, so I think everyone on, on, in attendance today has probably heard a lot about the importance of big data in machine learning. Uh, but at Valence, we're far more interested in the concept of, of smart data. So in other words, how can we very efficiently improve our model's understanding of the SAR so that they can better generalize from the smallest amount of experimental data possible? And what's shown in this slide is an example from an actual drug discovery program. We have a, a set of parameters that we're designing for on the left-hand slide. We have a set of 15 to 20 AI-designed compounds that we're synthesizing and profiling in these assays. 
And what's shown in the hit rate column on the left-hand uh, left hand section is the number of AI design compounds that meet the desired activity threshold within this first batch of synthesis. And we see that for some of these parameters, uh, such as potency, we have very low hit rates, maybe one or two compounds out of 20 that satisfy the desired potency threshold. But that's okay, because our goal is really about generating data that will help for the subsequent cycle. And what we see is that when we're smart about the data that we're generating, we can create very significant improvements in both hit rates and predictive accuracy without having to necessarily brute force our way through very significant amounts of data generation. And if we move to the next slide, uh, I want to just close on one final theme that's, that's very important for us at Valence, uh, which is how we can use technologies like those we've just introduced, along with others such as few shot learning, to learn very accurate uh, predictive models of key properties that allow us to drive optimization against multiple parameters simultaneously. Uh, and what's just shown on the slide are, are two representative AI compounds from a, a, a batch of molecules that were synthesized in a, in, a, in a live program. They're predicted and experimentally measured values and the parameters that we're focusing our optimization on. And what we find is that if we're smart about how we deploy these technologies in practice, we can make predictions that are well within the limits of experimental error, ensuring that if we're committing synthesis and profiling resources to an AI-generated compound, particularly if that synthesis is, is more complex, we can be confident that this molecule will behave the way we expect it to when tested experimentally. And if we jump ahead to the next slide, I just want to close by saying we are uh, actively deploying technologies like these, along with many others, in collaboration with uh, uh, several biotech and pharma partners, again, all in, in service of that overarching mission of unlocking important biology. Uh, and I'll, I'll close by saying that we are currently hiring across multiple roles in drug discovery, computational chemistry, machine learning, and engineering. Um, and if any of this sounds interesting to anyone in the audience, would very much encourage you to reach out. Uh, so that's a very quick introduction on some of the work that we're excited about at Valence, and I will now hand it over to Abe for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, hello and bonjour. Uh, I appreciate the, the chance to tell you about our work at Atomwise. Um, Matt, it was good to see you. Uh, I, I don't know if most people in this audience know, but, but Atomwise wouldn't exist um, without Matt's hard work back at, at uh, Ontario Centers of Excellence. Um, let me begin actually uh, just going through through the presentation. Um, and, and on the next slide, you'll see uh, a precy that, that summarizes what, what we're uh, doing it atomwise and, and, and what I want to cover today. So if, if we could go to uh, the executive summary slide, the next slide, please. Um, most people might not know this, but actually atomwise um, was the first team to use uh, deep neural networks for structure-based drug design. Um, uh, we were the first team to use convolutional neural networks uh, in, in drug design. Um, is, it, is it possible to go to, to the next slide? please. Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, we, we had the good fortune to uh, be at the University of Toronto uh, when modern machine learning was, was, was being kicked off. Uh, the computational biology group where, where my co-founder and I were, were students together was literally across the hallway from Jeff Hinton's a machine learning research group. And of course, everybody has, you know, is very familiar with the work of that team and, and has used those technologies. Um, if you ever talked to Siri or Alexa, if you've ever unlocked your iPhone because it recognized your face, um, you know, millions of people use these kinds of technologies every day. Uh, and, and so those breakthroughs were, were based on convolutional neural networks. Uh, we got to, to see early on and, and, and we're the first ones to realize that what could be used for image recognition would actually translate to molecular recognition. Um, and having built that technology, we've, we've built upon that foundation to um, an engine for uh, AI for chemistry. And really in the, in the tech-enabled drug discovery or AI for pharma space, there's, there's sort of two macro categories, one of which is AI for biology, principally interested in picking good targets. Uh, the other one is once you have a target, how you get the molecule, which is safe and effective. And so that's the AI for chemistry. Um, and amongst the AI for chemistry, uh, uh, efforts out there. Uh, I believe Atomwise is unique versus everything else that I've seen in that we use 
a single global model to make all of our predictions. So, so irrespective of, of which protein target you are working on, we use the same, same model uh, to make predictions on everything. And what I've seen everybody else do is build local models. Uh, when you, you have this problem uh, that Daniel was talking about where you have you know, uh, tens or hundreds of, of data points against, against a particular target, um, we're able to aggregate large data sets together and use, use millions. And we think that this global approach uh, actually gives us a number of, of concrete benefits. Um, first is that uh, our technology works when you don't have any data. Uh, it works in the zero data case. Um, and so if you're trying to truly extrapolate to uh, novel biology um, or, or trying to extrapolate to novel uh, uh, chemotypes, then, then uh, you, you're not constrained essentially to patent busting applications where somebody has paved the way and provided a training set. Uh, empirically also, these approaches become more robust in our hands. And, and so we're able to use uh, proteins where there is not structural information. So, so um, if there is X-ray crystal structures, we use it. Um, but in the absence of those, we can use alpha fold structures. We can use homology models. We can use um, uh, X, uh, cryo EM, NMR, et cetera, uh, structures uh, to provide the structural information. And, and our approach is robust enough that, that we succeed with those. Um, and then critically, and I'll talk about this a little bit, uh, we get the benefit of network effects. And so what I mean is uh, every project that we work on, because we have a global model, as we tune and improve that model, those improvements carry, uh, carry on to every other project. And so the, the accuracies are, approved, are, are improved for, for every other project as well. And we believe that that network effect is actually critical to achieving the kinds of accuracies that, that are necessary to play in this, in, in this space. Um, those are big claims that I just made, <laughs> really big claims. But in fact, I'm, I'm quite comfortable making them uh, because in the first era of Atomwise, we spent a huge amount of effort in validating the technology. Um, and we partnered with large pharma, with emerging biotech, um, with hundreds of academics around the world. And we were just able empirically and prospectively to deliver success after success after success. Um, and that's not just on, on easy targets like kinases where, where lots of uh, different approaches will succeed, but, but on uh, difficult and, and uh, hard to drug targets, targets uh, like protein-protein interactions, disrupting protein-protein interactions, uh, targets without uh, ligand data, without, without structural data. Um, and so then having seen that, that kind of, of benefit um, and that kind of performance, we decided to go pro. And, and so we've uh, focused the company on our own internal pipeline. Um, and so we have uh, some leading uh, assets uh, that are wholly owned with a large robust set of, of actually over 30 programs in early discovery. And so that's on one slide, the work of Atomwise. Um, now, let me move on to the next slide and I will um, uh, I'll, I'll try to give you a deeper dive into this. Um, and I think panels are always much more interesting when, when uh, there's debate and, and contention. So um, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative here, uh, deliberate. Uh, and, and this is about um, you know, the AI and, and, and bio and, and picking of targets and so forth, because there's, there's a lot of work in that. And, and at Atomwise, one of our fundamental contentions is that there's actually a lot of biology where, where there's no contention about whether you want to be able to drug it. It's just hard to drug. You know, my, my favorite example is KRAS, right? Like if you had gone to anybody a couple of years ago, they would have said, obviously I want drugs against KRAS. It wasn't a problem in understanding the biology. It was really just a problem in getting the chemistry. And so there's about 20,000 genes and only a tiny fraction, about 4% have ever had FDA approved drugs brought to bear against them. And so in some sense, the entire, whatever it is, $1.2 trillion pharma industry fits into this tiny green slice. And it's tiny even relative to the targets where we have good evidence implicating them already <clears throat> in human disease, but where we've never been able to bring medicines to bear against them. Um, and so in some sense, the work at Atomwise is about, is about moving that 16%, you know, the blue slice into the, the green slice and expanding that green slice. Of course, to do what's never been done, you need technologies that have never existed. And so on the next slide, I will, I will talk a little bit about this. Um, fortunately, there, there are um, technologies today that, uh, that exist. And on the next slide, I can show a visualization. Uh, essentially, if we could move to the next slide, please. 
essentially, uh, the synthetic chemists have been incredibly productive, um, and they have given the pharma industry access to a massive chemical space, um, uh, which is untapped, which is diverse, which is high quality. Um, and so, so this is by the adoption, it's really cultural shift, the adoption of what's called synthesis on demand. Uh, and the way, the way I explain this is, is it was really a business innovation that the chemical vendors no longer wanted to store inventory. Uh, you know, they, they had the idea that, that I'll get working after your check clears, right? So, so um, that's mostly been a business innovation. But what, it, what it meant was that they no longer stored the compounds on the shelves uh, in their warehouse. They stored the building blocks. You know, and they they know they have a 300,000 building blocks. They know 100 different coupling reactions to put those together. And so in one synthetic step, you can get 300,000 squared molecules. Or in two synthetic steps, you can get 300,000 squared squared molecules, right? And so the, the size of these, these catalogs grows incredibly quickly. Uh, and so today, you, me, anybody with a credit card and a web browser can order any compound out of a list of 20 billion compounds. And so, so that's already about 4,000 times as large as, as the largest big pharma uh, collections. Um, and so that's incredible uh, and, and has never existed. And these are available in four to six weeks. Uh, and this was pioneered by companies like Wuxi, uh, like Enamine, like Otava and others. Um, but, but the whole industry I think is moving this way because of that, the business uh, advantages uh, in terms of cash flow, in terms of uh, inventory management, accounts receivable, et cetera. And with our, our partners, we've gone and built proprietary databases, which are actually uh, a couple orders of magnitude even bigger than that. And, and so now we're about a million times larger than, than even the biggest big pharma collections. And so there's a few consequences uh, to the, the growth of accessible chemical space. Um, the first one is as chemical space gets larger, accessible chemical space gets larger and more diverse, you have a better chance of finding compounds which are useful for your target, even if it's never been drugged before. And there's huge opportunity uh, in these libraries. But there are challenges that come with those opportunities. And the first one is, I would say, or, or, or consequences that the entire industry has to grapple. I won't call them challenges, I'll call them consequences. The first one is that medicinal chemists need to become computational chemists. If, if, if we're being serious about our craft, 99.9% .9 of molecules which are available are only available computationally because you can order any of these 20 billion, but the first experiment has to be computational. The, these molecules don't exist on this planet and have never existed on this planet, but they're available to be synthesized, shipped, you know, quality controlled by mass spec, shipped to you in four to six weeks. And so the vast uh, range of molecules that, that, that we have access to only have access to um, uh, computation. Second, all of a sudden the pharma industry has to care about things like algorithmic efficiency and computational infrastructure. Uh, and it's hard to scale to these numbers. Think about you know, Facebook, if it had a, a, a page for every person on the planet, that's only about 7 billion uh, people. You know, uh, here, 20 billion is, is three, times, three times larger. Um, so these are, are, are large data sets. And the third one, and this is what's critical, the third one is that the level of accuracy which is needed is incredibly high. Um, and, and here's what I mean. Imagine you had a computational approach which was 99% accurate. That intuitively sounds like we should be done, but 99% accuracy, when you run that over 20 billion, that residual 1% inaccuracy means you're gonna have 200 million false positives. With whatever accurate picks you, you, you have in there, they're gonna be lost in a sea of 200 million false positives. And since you can't follow up on 200 million, for practical reasons, you'll never actually find your answers. And so this means that you need far better than 99% accuracy to, to use these spaces. You need 99.9999999% accuracy. Um, and, and that's difficult. And that's why you hear us obsessively talk about things like data quality and network facts, et cetera. OK, um, let's actually skip the next slide and go on to, to the following one. Um, and here, I just want to highlight very briefly is just in the interest of time, um, this difference between our global approach and, and um, other people's, what we call local approaches. So uh, in the global training, we might, our, on the left, uh, we start working on target one, we put it through the discovery engine, we, we 
point it to one of these ultra large libraries that we were just talking about. And the engine works as a matchmaker where it basically gives you a ranked list of the best molecule, the second best molecule, the third best molecule, dot, 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 the three trillionth best molecule. And we can buy the top of the list, have them tested, feed that data back into the engine, similar to how Daniel was, was, was describing, you know, and then, and then loop in improving the engine. But the real magic happens when, when we add another target to the portfolio and you work on target two, you're already using the benefit of that improved engine. So as you iterate on target two, you continue to improve the engine. So then if you ever do another iteration on target one, again, you're, you're getting the benefit. So that's the network effect that I was like. And in contrast, what I've seen everybody else in the space do um, is that they have what's called local training. And so you build a new model for every target that you work on. And in essence, not only does that constrain you to, to needing a training set for that target, but further, you, you kind of hit reset on your accuracy when you move to, to a new target. Um, and so you don't get the benefit of those network effects. Um, and so, as I said, uh, we, we think that's shown. And so, again, these are big claims. On the next slide, I will talk about our, uh, our results. Um, you know, we spent a huge amount of time um, proving to ourselves that, that we could do what we were talking about. And so uh, one of the ways that we did this was by partnering with academics. And so, you know, imagine that you're a professor um, at, at you know, Montreal or McGill or, or, or University of Toronto, my, my alma mater, um, and you're working on protein XYZ. You would tell us that you want molecules for protein XYZ. It could be in Alzheimer's, it could be in, in cancer, COVID, whatever it is you're working on. Um, you tell us protein XYZ, we go screen those sets, we buy the top of the list, we get them plated, formatted, quality controlled by mass spec, we ship them to you, and then we declare success when you pick up the phone and say, Eureka, what was in well F8? Um, and, and so we've worked with over 250 universities and research hospitals around the world. Um, and in about 80% of these, on a single 96 well plate, we're able to find interesting molecules for, for our collaborators. And as you can see on the right, you know, our successes include challenging targets, targets where selectivity was the problem, targets where we had to disrupt protein-protein interactions, where we were going after allosteric sites, where we were uncovering novel, novel biology by identifying uh, new cryptic sites that hadn't been described, and even you know, this OTU-D7A case um, where we had neither the benefit of extra crystal structures nor any known ligands. So this is true extrapolation to novel, novel chemical space. Um, I will just give two additional slides because I'm, I'm over time, I think. Um, and so those results, uh, sorry, previous, yes, thank you. Um, those results with academics are actually recapitulated when we work internally. And so this is a snapshot of our, of our um, in, in a tranche of our internal discovery. And the first thing you can see is that this does work at scale. Um, we can find interesting things across a wide range of, uh, a, a large number of targets. Um, and in general, actually, what's interesting is more than finding a single novel scaffold, we actually find um, uh, dozens, typically, on average, 25 diverse scaffolds. And of course, our medicinal chemists love that because if there's a herd problem in one of these, the whole project moves forward, right? You can lose 90% of these scaffolds um, and still, still survive this project. And the scaffolds are actually quite, in, quite appealing to the, to the eyes of medicinal chemists. Lipinski compliant, uh, modular, synthesizable, scalable, et cetera. Um, and, and this I want to, drug-like, this I want to point out is different from DNA encoded libraries, uh, where the, the initial hits are typically not directly developable. Um, and so this all goes to the speed of being able to, uh, to develop these, is, is you start with better, uh, better hits, better leads, you'll, you'll get through the process faster. Um, and then furthermore, you can see that in 30% of these programs, we're actually getting double or triple digit nanomolar potency in the very first screen. Um, and so again, that goes to speed, uh, to, to moving the, the starting point up, up further. Um, and what you're seeing, we're getting in about four months. Um, and so on the next slide, I'll give you just a case study and uh, then I'll, 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 I'll stop there. Um, so this is CDK5. Uh, so with CDK5, there were sort of two bars. Other people had described CDK5 inhibitors, but nobody had described CDK5 selective inhibitors and you want selectivity over CDK2. Um, and so that set up two bars of success. The low bar is we want to find novel scaffolds with novel IP, um, uh, so potent and novel. Uh, the high bar was potent, novel, and selective. And, and spoiler, spoiler alert, we're going to clear both bars. And so here uh, we began, we screened 16 billion compounds. Um, and out of those, we selected a diverse set of 786 um, scaffolds to, to be physically tested. 
And so this is 0.000005% of, of the catalog. Um, and so when I was talking about better than 99% accuracy here, it's 99.999995 uh, accuracy. And if you're used to you know, high throughput screening, you would usually test hundreds of thousands of compounds. So this is less than, than, than 1% of, of a typical high throughput screening. Day. Um, of those, 84 were active and 80 reconfirmed um, on, on validation. And so slightly better than 10% accuracy. And again, if you're used to high throughput screening, this is a uh, hundred times better uh, hit rate than high throughput screening. Um, and, and the best compounds here were actually double digit nanomol or 33 nanomol. Um, and so that's good, but again, better than just having a single compound, which is, which is potent. Uh, we actually had 15 diverse scaffolds uh, of double or, or triple digit uh, nanomolar potency. And so that's very exciting to our um, to our, our uh, medicinal uh, chemists um, uh, because of the optionality. And then you can take that data and turn it on the right-hand side um, and uh, you can plot CDK2 selectivity and you see that, that we have four scaffolds that range from 10 to 60 fold selective, uh, which again, nobody had been able to, to deliver. And all the data that you see on this slide was done in four months and $75,000. And so I won't get into our ADMET modeling here. I was focusing on, on hit discovery because that's what you need to work with these ultra large catalogs. Um, this, these same ideas can be applied um, in our hands to, to ADMET uh, modeling as well. But I'm, I'm way over. I apologize to my, my co-panelists. I'll stop there. I can't see my slides. I guess they're coming on. You should be up in a minute, Ola. Okay, okay, good. Okay, hello and thanks for the invitation and uh, give me a opportunity to, to give a talk and uh, so, so I come from clearly from, from a different background than the two first speakers. I come from a pharmaceutical background, so I'm working at the uh, AstraZeneca in Gothenburg over in Sweden. So I would like to give an introduction how we're using AI and machine learning for drug design in the pharmaceutical industry. So next slide, please. So, so in the end, we would like in drug design, we like to answer two questions, which compounds to make next in a drug discovery project and how to make the compound. And of course, it might sound easy, but of course, there's actually a lot of consideration to take into account. So if you go to the next slide. So, so basically just, uh, so to say, introduction, how we optimize compounds. We go through compounds, for, uh, so say optimization for what's called a design, make, test, analyze cycle. So we start with, with an initial hit, uh, uh, which can come from high throughput screening, DNA encoded library screening, fragment-based screening, or knowledge-based screening, like in, including uh, virtual screening. And uh, when you have a starting point, it's usually weakly active, unselective, potential tox risks. And then you go for multiple rounds of what's called design, make, taste, analyze cycle. So iteratively, optimize the compound. And then in the end, you, you have a candidate drug that is potent, effective in your in vivo models, uh, metabolic stable and so on. And it's very difficult to say how long time it takes. It really depends on the starting point, the indication and so on. But if you average over many indication of products, maybe three years could be, a, so to say, an approximate time. And if you go to the next slide, and how can we then apply AI to, to actually improve uh, the DMTA cycle? And that we can do for two things. We can maximize the learning. So we try to learn as much as possible in each cycle so you can reduce the number of cycles. And then uh, secondly, you can also, through machine learning AI, predict a possible or suitable synthetic routes so you can increase the speed of each cycle as well. If you go to the next slide. So this is a quite a heavy slide and probably 
the most important in my presentation. So where are we with AI-based drug design? Clearly, I can't go into the details here. Uh, first, how can we sample the chemical space? And I think there has really been a revolution. I mean, before, say, the genetic algorithm, you could uh, maybe sample 10 power 10, 10 power 15, uh, molecules, but now with deep learning, particularly with current neural network, you can actually sample the whole chemical space. Uh, and, and I'm a firm believer, you should actually design and synthesize the right compound, not necessarily the, the fastest compound. So I think it's really to go for quality and find the best compounds in the chemical space. So, so basically to navigate the chemical space, I think it's, it's not a bottleneck anymore. We have shown with recurrent neural network that you, you can sample the whole chemical space. Uh, we were pioneers using recurrent neural network for uh, drug design, and you can see our papers and also we have open sourced our codes, so you can ha have a look yourself and, and try it out. The bottleneck is the scoring. How do you actually score the, the molecules to, to progress the, the, the best molecules? And I will come back to that. You have synthetic root prediction. It has gone from rule-based method to more deep learning based methods. We, we have the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. We, we have also transformers that you can use for synthetic first step and then root prediction. I think there's been a lot of nice progress here, uh, but it, it started to get really hampered the whole field by the lack of good data. Literature data is basically only positive examples and not, not negative. And there's also challenges to, to mine internal medicinal chemist electronic laboratory notebooks. Uh, the ELNs, so as they are called, are actually very good at doing what they have been designed for to, to protect the intellectual property. They are not that easy to programmatically extract data from. Uh, when, when it comes to molecular property prediction, of course, we have done that for decades. So what is new there? And we have a lot of new uh, flexible deep learning approaches. Molecular graph convolutional maybe is the most uh, famous, but there are a lot of others. Uh, uh, and you can use them in innovative ways, like you can do privacy preserving machine learning. So you can actually, with, with other partners, train your neural network without sharing the data uh, to improve your models. So, so Astra and nine other pharma companies are part of a project Melody that try to do that. Uh, but I think it's also for me, molecular property prediction by activity in particular is the biggest disappointment so far. There have been no alpha fold two moment. Uh, there, there are regularly competition organized to assess objectively the progress in bioactivity prediction. But in fact, the prediction have been very small uh, during the last five years. There have been a sample competi competition, the illuminated drugable genome competition, and there's a new competition called CASH, uh, organized by the Structural Genomic Consortia in Toronto. So if anyone Lisa, today have a new method. Please take part in that competition so we can actually see how well your method is working. Uh, 3D protein structure prediction. There have been stunning progress with alpha fold 2 Absolutely a fantastic work. But to, to go forward, you are basically need also to include the dynamics to be really useful for, for virtual screen or computational work. You need to include the dynamics. It's not enough with the uh, static structure. We can help you still to solve X-ray and cryo-EM structure. I think it's, uh, it's also important to understand this AI applying drug design is not only about uh, uh, the AI and uh, machine learning methodology. You, you also need to have, a, what we'll come to the next slide, an AI plus vision. Uh, so it's not only about the AI methods, it's about the high throughput data generation, it's about the automation. It's about the joining machine learning AI with physics-based modeling. And, and it's also about the culture. I think to have impact, really, you need to have an AI-first culture. And of course, then, if you're in a big company, it's continuous training and education of your staff members. So if you go to the next slide. So what do I mean with the AI plus vision for drug design? It's, it's uh, when it comes to high throughput data generation, there's a lot of progress in automation that could be used to generate much better and much more consistent 
data sets. For chemist automation, you cannot do high throughput experimentation, so much better establish what is the best conditions, what is the substrate scope, and so on. Uh, you, you have in uh, technologies in imaging like cell paint. So, so basically now you can do high throughput uh, characterization of your compounds in your compound collection to create biological fingerprint. And as than many other pharma companies, part of the YAMP CP uh, consortium led by Broad that is doing exactly that and also will release a big data set to the public. Uh, you, you have other technologies also coming up like DNA encoded library. So you can actually, instead of screening in high throughput screening, maybe 2 million compounds, you can screen several billions of compounds that you then can model. So there are some in inspiring work in the literature from uh, uh, Google and, and, and other companies there. And then you need to, it's not only enough to speed up the design, you need also to speed up actually the make and test of the compound. So basically you, you can have a more autonomous optimization of compounds that then can be guided by AI. So to say through decision-making and uncertainty, you can include human in loop modeling. Uh, and I think that's, that's really important as well to cut the, the timelines to deliver the clinical candidates. I think there's still bottlenecks in the automation to do generally multi-step reaction with intermediate purification on an automation platform is a major challenge. There's no out of the box solutions for that yet. And I think that's needed to really be able to, to span the whole chemical space, not to be stuck in the, the one step uh, uh, chemical space, which then ultimately lead to you use those reactions which have the most commercial available building blocks. Combination uh, with machine learning, AI with physics, I think will be a very important topic. It's already, but I think it will be very important in the future. I think to, to really have a breakthrough in, in predicting affinity, I think it, you really need to combine the AI with physics, develop new force fields, speed up the free energy perturbation calculation, relative free energy perturbation calculation for optimization, absolute free energy binding calculation for more heat finding. To basically to come to, to true accurate, you can get this uh, alpha two moment in, uh, so to say, in prospective competitions. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so I think what's important when it comes to AI, because that's usually very, let's say, contentious. So I think it's very important to keep a balanced view. I mean, it, it has a tendency to po polarize. So, so I think it's actually important, and I hope we can do that in, in the following discussion to keep a balanced view, to acknowledge that having progress have been made in molecular generation, in synthesis prediction with AlphaFold 2. I think it's fair to say the progress will continue. There will be better hardware. Uh, high throughput data generation, as I mentioned, there will be novel and innovative algorithms. I don't think transformers is the last word. It's very efficient algorithms, but it, I think there's something more coming after that. And as mentioned for affinity prediction, deep learning based force field have a, have a potential to actually solve that problems. Uh, there are also properties that I think that will always be difficult to predict with machine learning AI. In vivo properties directly from molecular structure will be difficult. And it's because several factors, the, the, it's very expensive to generate the data. The data have a lot of variability, so you're much more unsure about your data points, its exact value. And in particular, it's a very complex phenomena. So if you change your molecule a little bit, you can change the solubility, you can change the permeability, you can change the metabolic stability, you can change the plasma protein binding, you can change the affinity both on primary target and off target. That means that the surface that you want to model with machine learning AI will be very complex and non-smooth, and that will make the prediction much more difficult. If you go to the final slide. And then, of course, it's important. What does success look like? And of course, like internally, and we have, and I'm sure many other pharma have, we have metrics that we would like to time, save time uh, with our investment in machine learning AI. But I don't think that's the, the success. It's actually the outcome of the success. It's the result of the success. So I think true success is actually around trust. 
uh, that you actually you trust the AI design molecules in the same way that in a drug discovery project, uh, you, you trust the exit crystal structure. So that's two parts. You trust in the prediction for the individual molecules that, that they are reasonably correct and the molecules are worth to synthesize. But it's also the trust that if you run a project in an, what to say, AI first mode, you can actually come to the end point, the clinic can do it faster than with traditional methods. And I think if you go to the next slide, it's just a snapshot of the people that uh, in the team that I'm honored to leave. And with that, I will leave over to Marina, the next speaker. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marina, co-founder and chief product officer at Salino. Um, and I'll start when my slides come up. Thank you so much. Okay, so again, my name is Marina, co-founder and chief product officer at Salino. We're automating iPSC-based cell therapy manufacturing. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Should mention that we just closed a $80 million Series A round co-led by Leaps by Bayer, Humboldt, and 8BC which we're incredibly grateful for because we need these resources to build what is really the first AI powered laser editing platform to make cell therapy manufacturing autonomous and scalable. So on the next slide, here I just wanna to touch on our team. We're taking a very multidisciplinary approach combining AI, laser physics, stem cell biology, and that is absolutely reflected in the makeup of our team. We are eagerly trying to hire. So if you are interested, or if you know anyone who could be interested in joining the team, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And on the next slide, we have a fabulous group of advisors with significant expertise in cell therapy and the regenerative medicine space from industry and academia. Next slide, please. And so here we're getting into how our platform works. Um, in Abe's presentation, he mentioned that the problem is really target engagement and not target selection. And I would say applying that idea to the cell therapy space, I largely agree. Um, IPSC derived cell therapy developers know that it would be valuable to generate IPSC derived retinal pigment epithelial cells for an age related macular degeneration patient, or they know it would be valuable to generate IPSC derived dopaminergic neurons for a Parkinson's patient. But the challenge is really in manufacturing those cell types. And so what we're doing is we're using AI, image guided machine learning, combined with laser editing and automation and robotics to enable the manufacturing and to make it more precise, more consistent and more scalable. On the next slide. This is an image of our automated R&D system. This is well plate based. So we have a robot in the middle that takes 96 well plates and moves them from subsystem to subsystem. So the incubator, automated liquid handler, automated imaging system, automated laser processing system. And what's nice about using image guided machine learning and laser processing. Here, we're using a well plate based system, but image guided machine learning and laser processing are also compatible with closed manufacturing. So in parallel to running this automated R&D system, which we have up and running right now in our Cambridge location, we are also in the prototype phase for a GMP grade system, which is based on a closed cassette, but still uses these image guided machine learning algorithms to characterize cells, make better in process decisions, and still uses the laser processing to manipulate or remove individual unwanted cells. And so I should also mention one of the ways in which we're using this automated R&D system is to take the large volumes of experimental data that are necessary to train the machine learning and deep learning algorithms that we're using. And the automation is all enabled by our software infrastructure, which we have a schematic of on the left. If you go to the next slide, this is a workflow for how we engage with the automated R&D system. We are taking traditionally manual protocols. So for example, reprogramming, going from CD34 positive cells to iPSCs or differentiation, going from iPSCs to retinal pigment epithelial cells or dopaminergic neurons. And these protocols have traditionally been performed manually. It's a tedious process, requires a high level of operator expertise. 
But we optimized these protocols on the bench, similar to everyone else in the industry. And then we transfer these protocols to the automated system. And so the cells and the reagents are transferred to the automated work cell. The automated work cell can go through these iterations of incubation, liquid handling, imaging and machine learning based characterization and laser processing um, at whatever frequency is necessary. So for example, in the case of reprogramming, we typically image about once every doubling cycle. But in the early days of reprogramming, those first two weeks, as the colonies are emerging, changes are happening very quickly. So in those phases, we image much more often, about once every four hours, which is not something that would be feasible to do if you weren't using an automated system because no one wants to come in in the middle of the night to image cells. Um, but we run the process for reprogramming or differentiation on that automated work cell. At the end, we remove the cells. We run the same NQC release criteria assays as everyone else in the industry. Um, we're not, not yet replacing these NQC assays with machine learning, not until that is more widely accepted by regulatory agencies. But the reason I like to mention that is because really what we're using machine learning and deep learning to do right now is to make better in-process decisions, to enable the automation, to make the process more consistent, to make the process more scalable and to therefore improve our yield. Um, but by running these processes, we also continuously collect more data that can be used to refine those image guided machine learning algorithms. If you go to the next slide, please. These are examples of productionized AI capabilities that we're using for our first product. Our first product is uh, automated iPSCs, starting with CD34 positive cells, going through the reprogramming process, ending up with iPSCs. So we have a productionized AI algorithm for identifying the location of each and every single cell. And so this is something that might typically be done with a DAPI stain, but we don't want to have to stain our cells in process with a stain that requires sacrificial sampling. We want to be able to identify the nuclear location of each and every single cell in Brightfield. And so we have a cell location inference algorithm that achieves that. It's mostly, it's most important for identifying the cells outside of colonies um, to target them for laser removal, because we also have a separate algorithm that detects colonies and draws boundaries around colonies. Um, and it also enables us to click on a colony and see images of that colony back in time. So this panel of three pairs of images on the right that green colony outline is the result of that algorithm and it's marking this colony over the time span of this is uh, two days. And so what that allows us to do is when we're ready to do clonal isolation, because many of our partners in the IPSC space prefer monoclonal IPSCs as opposed to polyclonal IPSCs. First, we're able to do that clonal isolation with the laser. So we can laser remove any unwanted cells can laser remove all but one colony. But what this algorithm allows us to do is to go back in time for that selected colony and check, did that colony appear to originate from a single cell? Is it indeed monoclonal? Or does that colony appear to have been the result of two colonies colliding, in which case it would be polyclonal? So if we go to the next slide, one of the other abilities that we have since we've built this algorithm that can identify individual cells and identify all the colonies is to calculate well confluence for every well. And I should mention our wells are square shaped and so that's why these look square shaped, but we've built this confluence detection algorithm both for um, imaging in 10x and imaging in 4x and we've measured this algorithm's performance against human manual reviewers. So that red line in that plot is the algorithm and those colorful dots are all different reviewers that are looking at images and saying, I think this is 50% confluent. I think this is 60% confluent. Um, and so there are a couple of interesting takeaways here. One is you see that the algorithm consistently overestimates compared to the human reviewers. And that's because when the humans are looking at the well, they see the larger colonies they don't always necessarily catch the smaller colonies or the individual cells, and the algorithm is catching that. Um, but the other piece of this plot that I think is interesting and more important is that there is discrepancies between the reviewers' estimates of the confluence. Um, and so what that means is, you know, if you talk to five different stem cell scientists and you show them an image and you ask them, what confluence do you think this is? You'll get five slightly different answers. And we wanted to make that estimate much more consistent 
because confluence is used to make important decisions such as when to pass it to the cell population. So by using an algorithm that consistently gives you the same estimate for a given confluence, we're able to make those passaging decisions in a more robust, consistent way and able to track information on growth and proliferation rate more, more robustly. If you go to the next slide, so I mentioned that I like to, this is something I like to do at conferences, um, to show folks this, these images of a well. So the image on the left is bright field. It's heavily normalized. That's something that's necessary for training our image guided machine learning algorithms. The image on the right is output. The reason I show this is because the contrast on the left image is not great. But if you look at the image on the right, I like to ask people, what confluence would you estimate this is? And just, you know, take a minute to look at it, make an estimation. And then if we go to the next slide, you can see that it's actually 40%. And I think this is such an interesting demonstration because when I ask this at conferences, I get 50, 60, 70%. Um, so you can see that there's, there's value in having a more consistent metric, especially when that metric is used to make in-process decisions that affect the development and the production and the manufacturing process, like the timeline for passaging. And so if you go on to the next slide, um, so this is just kind of a fun add-on. So one, you know, one thing that's interesting about the stem cell space is that stem cell scientists care a lot about their cells. Um, there's a culture of typically, you know, going in on a very regular basis, looking at the cells under a microscope, making sure that they're headed down the right path. And so what we did, since we're using this automated system that's automate, automatically imaging these cells every day, we created this application that's called William the Well Writer, <laughs> and it takes those images that are taken every day and automatically uploads them to Slack. So now our biology team can look at these images from the comfort of their couch at home instead of having to come into the, into the lab every single day, um, including the weekends. And if we go to the next slide, so these are examples of applications of laser processing. Um, and a big part of what we're using the image guided machine learning algorithms to do, I mentioned, is to make in-process decisions to improve our yield. Some of those in-process decisions include identifying cells that need to be removed with the laser. And so in the left panel, in this example, and the images on the top band are all before laser processing, the images in the bottom band are all after laser processing. So in that lef left panel, you see we've used the laser to do clonal isolation. So we've laser removed all but one colony in a well, allowed that colony to grow out. This is how we generate monoclonal iPSC lines. The image in the middle, those areas that are marked in cyan are actually areas of cells that were targeted for laser removal. So here what we did is we took one colony and we laser removed chunks to break it up. And so there are a couple of interesting applications for this. One is simply, if we have a large colony that needs to be split up before passaging to the next well, we can use the laser to do that. Um, but we can also use this to remove spontaneously differentiating portions of colonies that may be unwanted. And this is something that's generally applicable so I should mention the laser processing system is actually fairly cell type and biology agnostic. Um, it works on other cell types, not just iPSCs. And so in general, if there is a cell population and there's a need to identify and remove an unwanted cell type that appears in that population, we can train image guided machine learning algorithms to identify that cell type, potentially label free or using live fluorescent labels, whatever is preferred, and then laser remove those unwanted cells. Uh, and so this image on the right, this panel of images is showing, this is again iPSCs here, instead of laser removing colonies or pieces of colonies, we're laser removing individual cells to manage density. Um, so you can see in the top image, it's slightly more overly dense in that top area. And then in the bottom panel, we've removed individual iPSCs to achieve a more uniform web-like density across the well. Um, and so there are a couple potential applications for this. If there is a need for, the cells to stay in the same location, but to divide more times, for example, to clear the reprogramming vector. That's something that we can enable by laser removing some cells, allowing the other cells to grow into that space. Um, there are also, you know, potentially certain differentiation protocols that would do best and produce more consistent results if they were always started off on the right foot with a very specific cell density or pattern. And so that's something that we can achieve with the laser. We can use the laser to remove individual cells to achieve arbitrary patterns. So if we go to the next slide, this is another fun application of the laser. This is actually what I spent my entire PhD doing. Um, we can also use the laser to deliver cargos into cells. 
And there are a lot of intracellular delivery techniques out there. Electroporation, lipofection are both widely used. The, what makes the laser-based intracellular delivery unique is that it enables you to do spatially selective delivery of cargos into cells. So here we have a sheet of uh, confluent cells and those stripes from left to right. That black stripe is where we laser removed cells. The blue stripe is a viability stain. So we didn't do any laser manipulation to those cells. The green area are cells to which we've laser delivered a green fluorescent cargo. And the red area are cells to which we've la laser delivered a red fluorescent cargo. Um, so you can imagine this could have interesting applications in tissue patterning, delivering one gene editing cargo to some cells and different gene editing cargos to neighboring cells. If you go to the next slide. And this is my last slide. So um, thank you. Happy to take any questions and excited to, to speak on this panel. Excellent. Thank you so much to um, all of our panelists. Um, and uh, if we can go to um, the kind of full screen mode and everyone can put their um, cameras and come off mute um, and we'll get straight into um, the panel. Um, you know, fantastic questions for the, from the audience. Um, and I'm going to start off on one question that came up several times uh, in the Q&A and also was um, uh, pre-submitted. And that is, when do we expect the first um, genuinely AI designed uh, therapeutic candidate? So uh, you know, without any um, experiment behind it. Maybe I'll um, start off with uh, Daniel for that answer. I mean, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh, Ola's answer here. I, um, I would maybe just quickly say, is, is, that, is that really what we should be striving for? I don't know if that's necessarily the, uh, the North Star here. Uh, one of the things that we believe very, very strongly at Balance in something that we spent a lot of time thinking about is how we can best combine the in cerebro intuition of the expert medicinal chemist with the, the somewhat unbiased generative design and how you can blend those two worlds most efficiently. Um, so I, I think maybe we, we all, we all would hope that that day is coming, but I, I just don't personally believe that that's, that's what we should be striving for. Maybe I can add, I don't think per definition it can happen, because in the end, if you have a clinical candidate, you need to go through all the IND process with all the talk studies to, to, for your submission to, to FDA and, and other authorities. And for that, per definition, you need a compound and quite a lot of amount of it to do all the necessary studies to, for your IND submission. Um, yeah, I I, I agree. I think I think the answer is never. I mean, if if mm -hmm. you think about um, when when uh, in aerospace, when Boeing, when Lockheed Martin, when Airbus designed a new airplane, they will simulate a thousand wings before before they ever build one. But you still build it. You still take it to the wind tunnel. You still do a test flight. God, I hope before I get on the plane. Right? And that's that's not a failure. You you want that. You want one experiment, but you want that experiment to validate. Um, you know. And so I think the way to think about it is. Imagine I gave you a kinase panel, but not just a kinase panel. A kinase panel will turn in 15 minutes, which let you screen, you know, 100 trillion molecules, which um, also did not just kinases, but, but you know, all the, the proteases and the tox panel and everything. Great. Okay. Like, what does that enable a medicinal chemist to do? It's, it's not that the kinase, you wouldn't ask uh, how long until we get, you know, a drug out of a purely kinase panel derived drug, right? Like you, it's a tool, it's not, it's not um, the answer. I agree with the other panelists. I think, um, you know, experimentation is part and parcel of the image guided machine learning algorithm development process. And it's also what makes it useful. So we're not trying to completely remove biologists from the equation because we need their expertise, but we're trying to use machine learning and deep learning to make these processes less tedious, less labor intensive and more consistent. Okay, and as Marina is conveniently talking, um, I'll ask her another question uh, that was pre-submitted in several different forms around personalized medicine. Um, so this is something that we've heard a lot about. Um, obviously, um, you know, in many cases, cell therapy might be the ultimate personalized medicine, but you know, they also exist as as uh, 
uh, uh, awesome disease uh, indications for small molecules and large molecules. So uh, the question for the panel is, um, you know, application of AI and machine learning uh, to accelerate the development of personalized therapeutics. Yeah, I think this is absolutely one of the areas where AI shines. Um, and, you know, Ola alluded to this in his presentation, but I agree that AI is just one piece of the puzzle where AI and machine learning and deep learning really shine, at least in our case, is in parsing large volumes of data and identifying patterns or correlations. But in order to be able to apply deep learning, you need a large volume of data to apply it to, and that typically requires automation. So for us, AI is enabling this development of personalized cell therapies, enabling us to make them more scalable, but it's paired with automated robotics, um, and in our case, laser processing as well. Yeah, I think there's also a lot of synergy uh, with, with personalized medicine because personalized medicine is a lot about information and with the progress in genomics, in sequencing, in uh, transcriptomics and proteomics and so on. I think it's very likely that through data science, machine learning, AI, the, the therapies will be much more personalized in the future than they have been historically. Um, and, you know, question for the panel related, um, do you think that is because of, you know, reduction in cost and time to deliver a medicine? So, you know, historically, the pharmaceutical industry has, you know, gone for, you know, large indication blockbusters. But does the, does the group think that uh, AI and machine learning, you know, actually gives opportunity for, for much, you know, smaller indications um, or smaller markets? I, I think so. I think every um, every time that we we improve the timelines, uh, reduce the cost, improve the probability of success, or or widen the set of accessible target space, right? Like you know, go and and, and really enable us to drug the undruggable. Then you're talking about being able to um, attack diseases which otherwise weren't weren't possible to um, to go after. Uh, so so I think as a species, we need to embrace these new tools. Um, another question that came up both in the pre-submitted as well as um, in the chat um, was related to um, supporting publications and, um, you know, where, where do the supporting publications that talk about um, molecular design, efficient syntheses, um, you know, algorithmic efficiency, um, you know, which journals do those publications exist in? Are there white papers, um, online resources? Because I think the, the uh, group um, online is extremely interested um, in, the, in the science behind these assertions. Um, we... Go ahead, Ella. So, so I mean, we, we publish quite a lot because we are also part of uh, training the next generation of research in AI machine learning for drug design through several initiatives, both in Sweden and on, on the EU level. So we, we do publish quite a lot, uh, particularly in journals like Journal of Chem Informatics, but there's a high standard of reproducibility. So we do release the code and if possible, the data sets as well. Uh, and we also, we have a GitHub account, uh, Molecular AI, where people can go out and try out to actually use our code. And, and I think it's important to try out particularly around generative modeling, because seeing is believing. When you have discussions uh, with, with people around generative AI, you do realize after a while that they probably actually never have tried it themselves. So, it's, so actually to try it out is very important. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with, with Ola. So if you go to adamwise.com, um, if you find our blog, we'll have pointers. We present at the American Chemical Society. You know, we, we publish in JMed Chem. We, uh, like there's, there's a lot of places we put it. Um, uh, and we have links to our presentations, for example. Uh, we, we published, you know, our original paper on the convolutional neural network for, for structure-based drug design um, on archive back in 2015. Because that, that's what is typical in, in the machine learning space. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, available and free for everybody to download. And again, you can find that uh, if you Google my name, um, you can find it. But also if you go to the blog at atomwise.com. I, 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 we, we view publishing as very important to Valence. Um, contributing to the community is very important. 
I think one of the challenges that we run into very regularly is that the, the difference between what it takes to get a paper published in, in NeurIPS or, or iClear based on I'm performing on some somewhat arbitrary benchmark and what it takes to actually add value in, in real life is enormous. Uh, we, often, we often get asked, aren't you worried about publishing? Aren't you worried about revealing your proprietary secrets? I think anyone who spent some time in the space realizes that there's a, a huge gap there that exists. Um, and I think one of the other most consistent themes we've, we've seen in the community is that the, the more secretive a, a company tends to be about what's under the hood, the less the less there actually is under the hood. Um, Ola and his group are, are, I think, paving the way and then setting a great example for the rest of the field in, in what they're publishing and the openness of, of what they're putting on GitHub and, and, and the like. Um, I think all companies in the space have a responsibility to, to contribute to the science and help push the field forward. If, if I could mention just one additional thing, um, you actually don't need to read our papers. That's the other, that's the other piece is if you're an academic, we run this program that I, that I talked about in my presentation, our, our AIMS firm, the Artificial Intelligence Molecular Screen. Um, and academics anywhere can apply with whatever target and assay that they have. Um, and then we ship molecules to you. And so, so you get to see in your own hands uh, whether AI uh, is able to succeed on, on your target. And so um, if, if you just go to the website, again, you can find our, our academic partnering. And, and then you don't have to trust anybody's paper, right? You don't have to look at their results. You can look at your own results. And so um, the last question for the panel, and this was a question uh, that came up a lot in um, the pre-submitted um, responses. Um, you know, what does the panel think about the role of big tech, uh, you know, moving into drug discovery? So, um, you know, Google, um, DeepMind uh, spinning up isomorphic labs, um, you know, Facebook, uh, Meta now, involved in protein folding, um, you know, do, do you think that we'll, you know, see Apple pharmaceuticals uh, at any point in the near future driven by uh, AI and machine learning? Should I start? So, so, so I think of course that that's an interesting question that suddenly got highly relevant with the uh, deep mind progress around AlphaFold 2. And, and sure, of course, clearly they have tremendous amount of resources, both in compute and in, in, in really smart people. So if they want, I do think that they, they can move, move into the space. But of course, we need to see what they really want to do, because uh, it's also a challenge to really mix a lot of different business models. So, so for me, time will tell. But, but I, I think they would have potential there, yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, a really, really interesting question uh, that hasn't that I haven't ever received at a panel or a conference before. So very, very interesting. I I generally believe that a multidisciplinary approach is important for solving a lot of the big problems in biology. Um, the way we've approached it, because Salino is co-founded by three physicists and engineers, has been by engaging really deeply with the experts in biology and medicine and making sure that we're using our platform to solve important problems that they actually care about. So if a company like Apple or Facebook were to enter the space, I would just want to see it done in a way where they're engaging with the experts in biology and medicine and making sure that all of the resources that they have, which are very extensive, as Ola mentioned, are being put towards the right direction. I guess I, I, I'd also add that um... I think the example of Calico is illustrative, right? I mean, Calico is is a, a bet by by Google to work in the in the pharma space. So, you know, I think their commitment goes back before uh, AlphaFold, although that is also a massive commitment. Um, and so, you know, it it's absolutely critical to to respect the experience of of people in in the pharma industry. I, I completely agree uh, with what Marina was saying. But you know what, it, if you just put down a million dollar, a, a billion dollar check, uh, you can get Art Levinson to work uh, for, 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 you know, the Alphabet uh, Corporation. And so, so it is possible to access people at, at a mere cost of a of billion dollars, which frankly is not that much to the players in this space, right? Like, so, I mean, like when Facebook's stock went down last week or two weeks ago, whatever it was, it went down by a Merck, right? Like, they've got a lot of money and so they could access the space if, if, if they want to and they are like and we can point to these examples where where they are excellent so 
Um, we're going to wrap up now. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all the people who joined the webinar. Um, uh, over 150 uh, uh, people were listening today. So I want to thank you um, all for um, listening in. Uh, I want to thank those of you who submitted uh, questions ahead of time, um, over 150 questions. So uh, really good questions. And perhaps I think, you know, we'll think about starting a blog to answer both everybody's online questions, um, as well as the questions uh, that were submitted uh, during the session that we weren't able to get to. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jesse for the concluding remarks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Philip. And first of all, thank you to the panelists, uh, Abe, Daniel, Ola, Marina. Thank you very much for uh, you know agreeing to participate and and for providing such a, a lively discussion and, and a great presentation. So, um, and Philip, thank you again for uh, you know co-organizing and co-hosting this. I think it's been a you know a really uh, uh, remarkable. Um, um, kind of event. And I would encourage everybody to, uh, you know, keep an eye out uh, coming in the coming months. Uh, there will be a third series where, you know, as we said, we were addressing kind of three main challenges, starting with the target now with in this discussion more on the actual therapeutics. And then, um, you know, we'll start to look at how AI can be used in more clinical development uh, of molecules in the next one, which should be coming in kind of late April or early May. So thank you, everybody who participated. Thank you again to the panelists and to Philip and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Take care. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.